So, with much ado, welcome to the June 11, 2021 regular meeting of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. This meeting is being held by teleconference pursuant to the governor's executive order N2920 and the 12th supplement to the mayoral proclamation declaring the existence of a local emergency dated February 25, 2020. Before we proceed further, I'd like to ask Commission Staff Member Ronald Contreras, who is acting as our moderator today, to explain some procedures for today's remote meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, meeting, the minutes of this meeting will reflect that due to the COVID-19 health emergency and to protect Commission members, city employees, and the public, the meeting rooms of City Hall are closed. However, Commission members and staff will be participating in today's meeting remotely. This precaution is taken pursuant to the various local state and federal orders, declarations, and directives. Commission members will attend the meeting through via, through video conference and participate in the meeting to the same extent as if they were physically present. Please note that today's meeting is being live cablecast on SFGov TV and streamed live online at sfgovtv.org backslash ethics live. Once again, sfgovtv.org backslash ethics live. Public comment will be available on each item of, on this agenda. Each member of the public will be allowed three minutes to speak. Comments or opportunities to speak during the public comment period are available via phone call by calling 1-415-655-0001. Again, the phone number is 1-415-655-0001. Access code is 187-131-7460. Again, Access code 187-131-7460, followed by the pound sign. Then press pound again to join the meeting as an attendee. You will hear a beep when you are connected to the meeting. You will be automatically muted and in listening mode only. When your item of interest comes up, dial star three to raise your hand and to be added to the public comment line. You will then hear you have raised your hand to ask a question. Please wait until the host calls on you. The line will be silent as you wait your turn to speak. Ensure that you're in a quiet location. Before you speak, mute the sound of any equipment around you, including television, radio, or computer. It is especially important that you mute your computer if you are watching via the web link, prevent feedback and echo when you speak. When the system message says your line has been unmuted, this is your turn to speak. You will hear staff say, welcome caller. We encourage you to state your name clearly. As soon as you begin speaking, you will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw yourself from the public comment line, press star three again. You will hear the system say, you have lowered your hand. Once your three minutes has, have expired, staff will thank you and mute you. You will hear your line has been muted. Attendees who wish to speak during other public comment periods may stay on the line and listen for the next public comment opportunity and should raise their hands to enter the public comment line by pressing star three when their next item of interest comes up. Public comment may also be submitted in writing and will be shared with the commission after this meeting has concluded and will be included as part of the official meeting file. Written comments should be sent to ethics.commission at sfgov.org. Once again, Written comments should be sent to ethics.commission at sfgov.org. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And with that, I call the meeting to order. Can you please proceed with item number one, the commission roll call? Commissioners, please unmute your microphone so that we can verbally, so you, you can verbally state your presence at today's meeting after your name has been called. Chair Embers. Present. Commissioner Bell. Here. Commissioner Chu. Here. Vice Chair Lee. Present. Commissioner Bush. Present. Madam Chair, with five members present and accounted for, you have a quorum. Uh, thank you very much. I want to welcome everyone back to the commission meetings in remote format. Um, and uh, I'm assuming since we all heard City Hall is reopening that we'll get some further direction from um, the mayor and, and others about what the future holds for commission meetings. But as far as I know, through the summer, we will continue in our remote meeting format. Um, 
the um, want to remind everybody when you're not um, speaking to mute your microphone so we don't get the feedback. And with that, I'm going to call agenda item number two, public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda. Members of the public who are already on the line and wish to speak should now dial star three if you've not already done so to be added to the public comment line. Um, Mr. Moderator, please proceed with public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ethics Commission is now receiving public comment on agenda item number two, remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. If you join the meeting early to listen to the proceeding, now is the time to get into the line to speak. If you have not already, please press star three. It's important that you press star three only once to enter the queue, as pressing it again will move you out of the public comment line and back into listening mode. Once you are in the queue and standing by, the system will prompt you when it's your turn to speak. So it's important that you call from a quiet location. Please address your comment to the commission as a whole and not to individual members. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on agenda item number two, public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the queue. For those who are already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. Stand by. Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. Thank you very much. I'm going to proceed then to call agenda or public comment is closed. And now I'll call item from the consent calendar, agenda item three, draft minutes of the commission's May 14th, 2021 regular meeting. Um, and uh, if any member of the public intend to offer public comment, they should dial in now and enter star three to be added. Item three is on consent. This item is considered routine. If a commissioner objects, an item can be removed and considered separately. Um, and before I ask if any of the commissioners wanted to sever any items, I, um, I don't know that I need to sever the draft minutes, but I did want to note, um, first thank um, the executive director Pelham for uh, following through on our request and sending the letter to the mayor um, concerning, you know, follow on to the um, investigative work and, and reporting back to us. But um, I know it was Commissioner Bell who really made the motion that we should take action in response to that item, even though I guess maybe technically I restated the motion before we voted. So it shows that I was the one who moved that the commission send the communication to the mayor, which I was just trying to restate the suggestion to Commissioner Bell. And so I just want to make it clear that um, I think, you know, whatever, credit where credit due. Uh, so if, if that can be a um, whatever clarification for the minutes that we all understand, I don't need to continue them unless somebody else thinks we should get them um, formally corrected. So uh, with that, is there anything else that anyone wanted to pull off of the consent calendar? Commissioner Bush. I, as a general rule, at this time and in future, I think it'd be good if the minutes showed which person wrote the minutes and gave it to the commission. If it was the executive director, it should say it was the executive director if it's someone she's that's been delegated to that, it should say. But I think it's it's a good practice to know who is the person who compiled the minutes and provided them to us. Um, 
Okay. Um, for the record, who does draft the minutes for the commission? Uh, 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 Chair Ambrose, the minutes are uh, drafted uh, sort of during the course of the meeting, and uh, they are usually captured by Senior Policy uh, and Legislative Affairs Council, Pat Ford. And okay. then reviewed as necessary for finalizing. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm getting reverb. Is that my, I mean, my bobby pin is interfering with my antenna no can you hear okay okay um sorry i'm just looking to see if anyone else has their hand up um all right with that uh then i'm going to call for public comment on the consent calendar mr moderator can you please read the instructions Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ethics Commission is now receiving public comment on consent calendar item number three remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you've just joined this meeting early, if you join the meeting early to listen to the proceedings, now is the time to get in line to speak. If you have not already done, if you have not already, please press star three. It's important that you press star three only once to enter the queue as pressing it again will move you out of the public comment line and back into listening mode. Once you are in the queue and once you are in the queue it's in standing by, the system will prompt you when it's your turn to speak. So it's important that you call from a quiet location. Oh, I think I skipped a sentence, excuse me. <laughs> Please address your comment to the commission as a whole and not to individual members. We are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. Stand by. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently taking public comment on consent calendar item number three, draft minutes of the commission's May 14th, 2021 regular meeting. If you've not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. Madam Chair, there is, there are no callers in the queue. And I do want to uh, clarify, I wanted to make sure, um, I do apologize. We are taking public comment on all consent items, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, yes, there is no callers in the queue. All right, then public comment is closed on the consent calendar. Can I have a motion to adopt the consent calendar? And So moved. Um, that would be Commissioner Chu in a second. Commissioner Bush or Commissioner Lee, either one. Um, I did want to just say thank you to the staff too for preparing the stipulations. Um, the I think it was a good demonstration of the streamline process at work. And um, anyway, I didn't want to just let that pass since. There's no further discussion. Um, so with the motion and a second, can you please call the roll uh, on the consent calendar? A motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Yes. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Vice Chair Lee. Aye. Commissioner Bell. Aye. Chair Ambrose. Aye. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to jump ahead to consent calendar. Nope, uh, that's item five. That is also, what number are we on to get us? Uh, Thank you, agenda item eight. Thank you. <laughs> All right, page turning here as we get through my script, I'm going to call agenda item eight, which is the discussion and possible action on the Ethics Commission annual report draft for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. Um, and before I turn it over to uh, Director Pelham, I did want to say uh, thank you very much to um, Director Pelham and to Gayathri for the draft. Um, I did want to um, emphasize, since we didn't talk about this before, uh, 
the charter requires that the chair and the executive director prepare a draft report uh, annually. Um, we had um, come up with a, you know, sort of a rough format, I'll say, with our, our annual report last time around, and we haven't really talked about it since then. So I do want to encourage the commissioners um, who have thoughts about how, how best to convey um, the, you know, um, whatever, the, the message that the commission wants to send to anyone who might be in the audience for the report. So, you know, please um, feel free to share your insights. I know that the draft that we had, it's not a even a final draft. It doesn't have the charts and um, final data that um, is still being accumulated because it is a, a fiscal year, end of fiscal year report, which doesn't happen until the end of June. Um, but I do want to um, thank you for uh, assembling all of the various um, facts and um, acknowledging, you know, the uh, events over the course of the year. So we have what I think is the bulk of the material uh, to work with. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Director Pelham, and then I'll take comments from commissioners, and then we'll go to public comment. Thank you, Chair Ambrose. Um, commissioners, as, as the chair just indicated, this is um, is meant to reflect uh, our, our information as we know it as of this point, uh, a couple weeks yet before the fiscal year ends. Uh, obviously, there are a number of initiatives and work that were under uh, underway this year um, that are reflected here. Those are not likely to change over the next couple of weeks, but we did want to make sure that when we have the final re report for you and for the public, that it does capture all the information that we have you know, through the fiscal year. Um, so the difference between the report we saw last year is that this really focuses on exclusively the past fiscal year that began July 1st. Uh, ish. It does recapture some of the changes that happened right at the beginning of the pandemic when we switched to fully remote work. Uh, but we, we did make a conscious effort this year to be mindful and responsive to the questions that you all raised last year in wanting to convey as much data as we had about the work that the commission is doing uh, and has done over the past year. Uh, so this morning, very interested to hear your feedback. Uh, suggestions, um, anything that you might like us to take back and work with the chair to finalize uh, for you uh, a document for the July meeting that can uh, reflect the commission's uh, uh, adoption of an annual report for the past uh, fiscal year. Uh, I would just say one last note that in looking back at the activity that went on during this year, I want to really acknowledge the work of the staff on um, the ongoing drive that we're making to continue to improve our operations and the impact of our programs. It's been a particularly challenging year as it has for everybody in government service. Um, but I, I was really pleased to see the hard work that went in to the report by the staff to pull the information that is accessible to us and to try to get it here to you timely so that we can really make this report um, something that the commission feels really strongly uh, reflects the work and the vision that you all have for, for the, the past year that we've been um, working together. So with that, I'll just turn it back to the chair and any questions that you have or any suggestions, we are uh, open to that and we'll be taking copious notes. Thanks. The the one, uh, and I'm going to defer to everyone else after I, I say this because I will um, help take in comments and, um, you know, work on the, on the edits. Um, the one thing I thought, uh, with respect to the final section of the annual report where the commission looks forward, um, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure that that um, we'll have an opportunity to fully flesh that out, you know, by the July meeting because we won't see, you know, sort of the next level draft. But as the um, if you're not prepared to do so today, then certainly for the meeting in July, if you could all um, focus on 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 that and and think about um, what sort of um, focus we want to set for the commission in the coming year, because I I do think um, there's there's more work too we need to do in terms of reflecting on you know um, where we've been. Um, and it's an, it's important for the reasons that you stated too to um, enumerate all of that and um, 
if for no other reason than to just understand why, you know, it's felt like people have really been striving this year. Um, but I, I do think it's important that we also set a um, focus for the, the future. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn to um, Commissioner Bush, um, if you wanted to start with some comments on the draft report. Thank you, Chair Ambrose. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think could be inserted into the annual report. One is uh, Director Pelham's letter to the mayor, which I think was in the last 10 days or so, in which uh, the outline uh, action items with a timetable, uh, which I thought was uh, an important statement and one I'd like to see circulated more completely to the commissioners as well as to the public. So I'd like to see that included in uh, the annual report. As part of that is also to include Commissioner Pelham's, uh, or Chair Pelham's uh, response to the Board of Supervisors hearing on the uh, board budget analyst uh, recommendations, because in that, uh, Chair Pelham enumerated each of the recommendations and a timetable for action by us. I think we need to surface that uh, clearly uh, in the annual report. Beyond that, I think that the annual report, as we're talking about creating uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, listings, I, I would like us to include information on how many lobbyists are registered with the Ethics Commission, how many uh, uh, permit expediters, how many major developers, how many consultants, and then in that should include how many were added this year uh, in each of those categories and how many clients they have. Because I think that gives a sense of the scope of what we face as a challenge as an ethics commission. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm gonna just go right on the list then, um, Commissioner Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair Ambrose. Um, I, I would agree with um, all the comments that Commissioner Bush uh, provided. And uh, I, I think that as, as I look at this, and, and I know this is just a, a draft format, and uh, as we present the numbers, I think last year we had uh, very clear charts. I think that would be a, a wonderful way in, in the beginnings, like just as a, a year at a glance, um, it, these are all the uh, to Commissioner Bush's point, these are all the, these are the number of requests that we handled, the number of audits we completed, the uh, the amount of public uh, public funds were dispersed through uh, the revised program, and then in terms of organizing the rest of the uh, of the report um, and the summary of the key highlights, um, I always like to think of you know, what are the key themes that that emerged from the year. And on page two, we have, you know, the focus was to improve program impact, heighten awareness of the laws, and ensure service excellence. So if we take those three as, as the, the guiding um, organizing principles for the report, I think we can say, here's what we did to improve programs, uh, impact. And, and, and for that, you know, I would say, you know, just at the top of, off the top of my head, you know, the, the public financing campaign was tremendous. Uh, I, I mean, the, the the results that we had, we had the highest number of candidates um, turning to the public financing system ever, right, historically, and we dispersed more money. And so I, I'd love to highlight the impact of, of that program. So, uh, and then, you know, how did, what did we do to heighten awareness of the laws? And so if we organize it in that way, I think then it becomes, uh, because there's a lot of of the tremendous work that was done this year. But if we organize it along those themes and you can see there's a through line for all of it and how it, it is all um, connected. And you know, I also wanna call out the fact that the commission staff you know, has been working remotely from their kitchen tables and 
and and living rooms and bedrooms uh, for the past year plus, and will continue to do so for another uh, another, you know, three three four months. And um, I, I I just want to call out that that is the fact that we have increased the number of people that we have served, uh, and. Uh, supported candidates, you know, virtually in this manner through an election season, uh, you know, I just think is, um, is, is really important for us to, you know, to recognize and, and celebrate uh, in, in this, in this uh, report. So I can, um, I won't go into like granular comments here, but I can follow up offline with, uh, with Director Pelham um, with some thoughts on, you know, how, how things can be can be uh, organized and, and worded for maximum impact. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I would agree. I know in the um, last year, I think it was you, Commissioner Chu, who, um, and, and maybe Commissioner Chu helped us with that um, sort of whatever, year at a glance, um, highlighting, you know, um, some of the um, important you know, um, information in a much more readily available and, and readable form. And I know in this one, there's a really long bulleted list of, of various accomplishments, which, I, and I will note, the first one that you mentioned is that I was appointed chair and Commissioner Bell joined the commission, which is hardly the priority item that we want to grab people with. So I think a reordering of that as you were saying, along a thematic line with some more subheadings so that if you're looking for a certain area that you might be interested in, you can more readily, um, it'll pop out at you a little bit better. But um, nevertheless, the effort was to just gather all manner of, of um, information and get it on a page so we can start with it. So. Um, and then I did see, I thought I saw Commissioner Lee's hand up, but no, it's not. So I don't know if that's intentional. I hope you really are at the beach with a palm tree behind you and that that's not just one of those phony um, backdrops. That looks really I wish lovely. we could all be at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I mean, that's a good one though, because look, your head isn't even moving in and out of the palm tree. That's impressive. Um, all right, and but my mind and my body is still here. Yeah, um, lovely. Okay, so no further comments. Um, Commissioner Bell, yes, yeah, please. Um, thank you. <clears throat> um, this is my first time reading one of these, so I don't have last year's really as a point of reference. Um, I thought it was extremely comprehensive. But as we were reading it, as we, as I was reading, I was wondering who our audience was, and I was just begging for some pie charts and some graphics to show some of that. And so I will, um, I think the comments by my colleagues are right on point, and it just seems like um, those percentage numbers that we are such a graphically oriented um, population these days that some of that stuff just was was just calling out for some kind of graphics to demonstrate um, what it was. And um, so um, I joined my colleagues in, in what they suggested, um, but I do wanna say, so it was very comprehensive. If you read it, you really got a sense of what happened um, during the year. And so I think these are just refinements, but um, so job well done. Um, but I think if we could um, show some pictures as they say, I think it would be helpful. Uh, absolutely. All right. Thank you for that. And with that, just make um, it fair. I'm sorry, uh, Chair Ambrose, I, I just wanted to add one thing, one other additional thought, if I may. Um, uh, I think to the point that um, we are, you had made earlier about how do we, how do we communicate the work that we've done in the past and then, and how does that connect with the work that we'll be doing in the future? And I think hanging over the city and over the commission, you know, is this ongoing uh, corruption investigation. So I think it would be beneficial for us to um, 
consider that as part of the backdrop and how do we communicate about it? Because, uh, and I will get to this later, the you know, terrific news about the funding for the ethics at work. So how do we show that in the past year we have laid the foundation for the work that's going to be coming like with ethics, ethics at work to address the culture of compliance here in the city? I think that there's an opportunity here for us to frame the work that we've done uh, in a way that shows that, you know, we are, you know, we, we're on this and we've done a, you know, we've done a lot. Um, look at our comprehensive scope of the initiatives that we've undertaken in the past year and the ongoing um, support that we provide to the city. And then we're going to build on that. I mean, you know, in, in the coming year with, with this, you know, ethics at work uh, initiative so that we can, instead of it having be, instead of having just, you know, a discrete set of, of accomplishments in the past fiscal year, but we can show how it is, um, we're, we're pursuing these, these specific uh, objectives and goals and, and, uh, and, and that it is connected with, with uh, what we'll be doing in the future. And um, how can it benefit, you know, more transparent and accountable government. Right, thank you. And that, that's exactly what I was trying to get at with the, um, with my thought that we might not exactly be in a position in July to finalize our forward looking statement. I mean, the board, you know, um, three chairs that we're, the mayor is recommending that we get the funding that we need to start that um, uh, effort on building ethics at work. Um, but it won't be in the bank yet by, by July 9th because the board won't have finally acted on the budget. I don't think maybe they will. Um, what do you say, Commissioner Pelham? I mean, Director Pelham, no? No, I think that's unlikely, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but I, I, that's the direction I think that we need to go in. I mean, if we're gonna recognize um, sort of the unsung heroics of this year of getting the positions, you know, getting the requisitions and the advertisement and filling those position, which if anyone who's ever tried to get anything done like that in the city, um, you can't even imagine what an achievement it, it is. I'm, I'm sure she's the, um, the other directors and department heads are probably in awe that she was able to get that much uh, support for staff. And now we're going to have more. So anyway, um, but the points that you were making, Commissioner Chu, I think that that's what I want everyone to think about how we're going to frame that forward-looking statement um, and I'm sure when it comes back in July that the graphs and charts that um, director Helen you know that they'll finalize as part of the final accounting for the numbers you know hopefully it'll be in the draft that we see so and with that I'm going to go ahead and ask the moderator to call for public comment okay and I do want to double check I do see hands still raised for Commissioner Chu and for Commissioner Bell did you have any other comments that you wanted to make uh, yes um, I really appreciate it Commissioner uh, Chu's sense in that and I think what Chair Ambrose um, who can uh, restate my emotions anytime for okay. me <laughs> I think what she's I would join in in what I think um, is the thrust of her remarks is that we should, I mean, instead, in, in addition, I should say, to being a recitation of what happened, it, this, this report, I think, um, Director Pelham could also be a opportunity to brand, to actually say here, the, you know, much, I don't need to repeat what Commissioner Tu said, but it, it prompted in me that thinking that it's not just a, we did this, we did that, we did the other, we did this. Um, it actually gives us a brand is to say, Here's why we're here, and here's what we're intending to do, and here you can see is what we've done, and we'll continue to do. So I, I don't need to go on, and but I really think it gives us an opportunity to to brand, and I think that's the thrust of what Chair Ambrose was going, and I really think that's something we should um, um, do and promote. Great. Um, yeah. No. Just now, we just need to roll up our sleeves and get it into words on paper as as somebody who's part of the drafting team I'm sure I've been in so many settings where um, there's a lot of great ideas but when you're the person sitting there at the computer that looks at it you're like did I capture all that so um, help me out when we get back here in July and 
or in between, feel free to contact me if you have some, um, you know, uh, precise way of communicating, I think, what the gist of what we all agree on. Um, and with that, because I know we have a big agenda today, I'm going to ask the moderator, please call for public comment. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item eight, discussion and possible action on ethics commission annual report draft for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. We'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. <clears throat> please stand by. Madam Chair, we have a caller in the queue. Welcome caller, your three minutes begins now. Good morning, commissioners and uh, Director Pelham. My name is Dr. Derek Kerr, a whistleblower. I'm calling to express my appreciation to the staff who compiled the section on whistleblower protection in the annual report. This is the first time that ethics has disclosed the number and explained the outcomes of retaliation complaints. We now have some idea why none of the 11 cases resolved this year were substantiated. The explanations provided are informative and commendable. So is the finding that 55% of city officers have failed to complete the required training in whistleblower protection. This degree of transparency helps to dispel the nefarious black hole reputation that ethics has acquired over the years. Hopefully your substantiation rate for retaliation complaints will increase beyond zero. It should be closer to 23%. That's the international standard recorded by 3,000 organizations surveyed in the NAVEX Global Benchmark Report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I, I uh, concur that um, that information was um, important and um, it is going to be one of our priorities to focus um, and review our whistleblower um, process. So thank you for your comments. Are there any further comments, um, commentators in the queue? Please stand by. There are no more callers in the queue. Uh, thank you very much. Then with that, public comment on agenda item eight is closed. And I'm going to proceed to call agenda item nine, which is a staff presentation on ethics commission annual budget as proposed by the mayor's office for fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 and discussion and possible action by the commission. And with that, I will turn it over to Director Pelham um, and congratulations. Uh, thank you, Chair Ambrose, and good morning again, Commissioners. Uh, yes, so we have uh, really very, very positive news to report in our budget report this morning. As you know from the document that we provided in connection with this item, um, the mayor, um, uh, you'll, you'll recall, of course, that we submitted our budget request to the, to the mayor's office in, uh, on February, in late February, as required by all city departments. Uh, over the past several months, we've been able to answer questions and provide additional detail to the mayor's budget office in discussing the commission's um, uh, demonstrated um, priorities, um, the way we're achieving our work and our plans going forward and the demonstrated need for that work. 
Um, so with that, the mayor's office uh, in releasing the mayor's proposed budget for the coming fiscal year uh, did identify uh, and recommend um, the full package of our recommendations uh, for the coming fiscal year, which is very, very welcome news, of course. Um, the budget that uh, we proposed as reflected in the mayor's um, uh, recommended budget that was issued, um, excuse me, on June 1st, uh, would propose uh, our fiscal year operating budget of about $6.5 million. It's roughly a 23% increase in our current operating budget. It would have a uh, staffing level that would be increased by eight from 25 to 33. Uh, importantly, the reason why those resources would exist is to fund new outreach and support for the city's workforce, all city departments. Um, on uh, our new Ethics at Work initiative, which is designed to um, build in a framework and support on a practical basis to help folks navigate ethical issues that arise and become much more familiar with the laws that apply to them so that people can stay far away from the lines that uh, would result in a, a breach of our city, city laws. So this would uh, fund a team of, of four to be specific uh, outreach uh, and, and training specialists and uh, that uh, would be um, uh, a, a program that would be funded for uh, what the city calls a limited three-year term process. Uh, that means we would uh, be hiring on an exempt basis, ultimately at the end of, before the end of this um, three-year limited term project, would be evaluating the program to see what we think the needs are at that time, and then converting the positions if the need is still there, uh, or if the need has changed to different positions, uh, to uh, to continue those into a civil service permanent basis. But this is extraordinarily good news. It will enable us to hire the positions as as we have in this past year through a temporary uh, an exempt process. Uh, but the work that we know is essential to be able to provide the kind of support in a different way, at a different level, and with a different focus uh, is, I think, a, a first for the city and a very important role that we'll be able to be playing with this support. So we're very much looking forward to talking with the Board of Supervisors about that, that project as well, uh, starting next week in their budget hearings. Uh, separately, uh, we've also uh, seen in the mayor's proposal a recommendation to embrace our additional request for investigative resources. This would include three new investigative positions, as well as funding to help us develop a case management system, which, uh, you know, if you have two investigators historically, it may not be that necessary when you have the volume of cases we've been seeing and the significance of the cases and the number of investigators we have. This becomes critical to be able to manage the work effectively. So that is something that would be uh, in, uh, included here as well. And then um, also importantly, uh, we just finished talking about the annual report but both for purposes of improved, consistent, standardized public reporting about the work that the commission does, as well as to help ensure that we build, continue to build into the fabric of our very operations, uh, data-driven decision-making to the greatest extent possible. We also have uh, seen rec the, uh, a recommendation by the mayor to um, fund our proposed uh, program performance and reporting analyst. This would be a position working directly with uh, deputy director and uh, Chief Operating Officer Guy Three Tykendeel, myself working with other teams in the office to really build into the fabric or to, to weave into the fabric of what we do on a regular basis, uh, uh, reporting indicators of progress, helping us know where the challenges or impediments continue to exist that may be keeping us from the achievements we're outlining. Uh, and so that's also tremendous news. It really does help strengthen our our performance tracking in a way that we, uh, we think uh, will be very, very helpful for the public to understand our work better. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, that's where we stand in terms of the recommendation by the mayor's office. Obviously, this did not take um, the, any, any cuts that initially were faced by the city when we were in the midst of the, in the depths of the pandemic. Uh, so we're grateful to see that we have uh, the opportunity to really advance our work in a very significant way in the coming year. And um, we will be looking forward, as I said, just to, to talking with the budget um, committee and the full uh, board of Supervisors uh, in the coming weeks, starting next week, as they consider the city's uh, the city's budget starting on the 14th and then continuing on the 21st. I am uh, happy to answer any any questions. Um, I, I should just make one last note, as I indicated in the report, uh, before turning it back to the chair, and that is that uh, one of the interesting developments this year is that uh, Budget Committee Chair Haney has, as part of his letter to departments, asked departments to. Um, report back during the budget discussions uh, 
what their efforts are going to be to help change tone at the top, helps strengthen uh, um, integrity throughout city government. And so there's a particular focus that I think we'll see in the budget discussions by all departments about what work uh, they're, um, they're doing to, to also align closely with some of the recommendations that we've been seeing coming out of the controller's office that have stemmed from the corruption investigations that have been ongoing over the past year and a half. Um, so uh, we are, uh, we'll be communicating um, as we did in this past week with all departments uh, about ways that we can be supportive of that. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll also be very closely monitoring that and, and, uh, and following up uh, to report back to you further as, as we know more. But that's, that's very good news. I, I appreciate um, your, your, your time just to walk through those highlights and happy to answer any questions. And Gaia 3, uh, uh, Ty Kandil, our deputy director is also uh, online and available to answer any questions if you have specific, uh, more detailed questions about the budget and line items. Thank you. And I'm going to turn to the other commissioners first before I um, hit my points. So I see um, Commissioner Chu, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Ambrose. And first off, congratulations. This is tremendous news. I mean, we were facing when we first started this, these budget discussions last year. Uh, you know, cuts of seven and a half percent and, you know, and really just cutting straight to the bone. So I think this is a really fantastic outcome. And I'm heartened that the uh, that the mayor and and um, hopefully the board of supervisors, you know, are in support of uh, the work that we're doing here. And and um, it, it's one thing to say that you're for uh, compliance and and, you know, clean government, but it's another to to fund and actually put resources uh, to to the work. So uh, very, very heartened for that. So I have a um, kind of a high level observation and then um, a very specific question. So I think that as we uh, move forward with the Ethics at Work initiative, it will be important to have as many metrics as possible to measure the impact of uh, the program and, and the work that we do so that we can have a baseline that says, this is what it was like before. And I'm not sure how to measure you know, compliant culture, um, or you know what the what the issues are. But if there's a way to be able to quantify and say, here's where we're starting from, and then and then the ethics commission delivered a set of programs, a set of interventions, a set of trainings, or you know, communication, or train the trainer, um, communication you know, messages like that that can start to create this culture of um, compliance, and then we can measure afterwards, like measure along the way, and show the needle moving. Um, I think that will be that will be really important to help us tell our story as to at the end of the, you know, at the halfway point and towards the, the tail end of the three year mark to then be able to say, look at what we have done, see how we have moved the needle from from left to right. This is the impact. And um, and here's here are the groups that we have have uh, have touched so far. And you know, we project that, you know, if we continue to do this work and roll it out, um, we could you know, based on our track record, we think that we could get to, you know, an even higher point so, so that we have data to back up the impact um, of, of our work. Um, so that's one. And then the second question is, uh, because timing is everything and um, we can only uh, start to make progress when we have the team in place. Great news that these positions will be able to be hired on an exempt basis. Um, and if do you have a, a Director Pelham, a, a, you know, a rough estimate of, of when uh, the team could be assembled, like by when um, to be able to uh, start um, on, on the work um, itself? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the, those comments and the, and the question, uh, Commissioner Chu. The um, the for the first year of any project, the uh, the funding that the city provides is what they call a 0.77. So that means funding actually doesn't happen for that position in a seat until roughly September or October of of the first fiscal year. Um, that said, uh, so in theory, we could have people in seats the first uh, immediately when that 0.77 kicks in to pay for nine months of salary. Our focus will be between now and the beginning of of the summer, I guess we're in the summer, um, but over the next couple of months, even as the, the budget is being finalized, we're gonna be taking the, the, the processes that we had in place this past year 
developing the job descriptions, clarifying the project list that we 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 know to be out there for the investigative work. We know what ethics at work would look like. So having those positions um, posted um, as soon as we possibly can. Hopefully, we'd be able to post them and hire you know post the positions before the fall, so that we'd be able to put people in seats as soon as we can when the funding is actually made available. So, uh, you know, that's a process that can take several months, but I, my, I, I, and so I would hope that we could say we would have people hired by the end of this fiscal year, or by the end of this calendar year in December to have eight positions filled. That would be, that will be ambitious, but we know that we only can make progress, as you pointed out, when we have seats filled. So that is going to continue our FY now 22 hiring plan will continue to be a top priority for us to make sure that we get those resources on board. Uh, so, you know, as I've done, I will keep you closely abreast of developments at each commission meeting to let you know if we're having any uh, challenges to that. But we have had a, a strong process this year, so I'm hopeful that that sort of time frame will continue um, and, and even improve over the coming months. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that. It's, it's just um, because we have a, an expiration date on the, on the three-year program term so that like, the, the longer it takes, and I, I'm, I know that everyone is all aware of this, just, but just to say it, the longer it takes to fill the seats, the less time we have on that 36-month window to be able to deliver results. So um, to clarify one point, if I might on that, it, uh, we do, I think the clock does start ticking with the, uh, you know, the positions once they're, once they're filled, but, but, uh, but our goal is to get those seats filled as soon yeah. as we can. And so we'll keep you informed, but uh, appreciate the support. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to um, move to Commissioner Lee. You had your hand up, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to echo my colleague's comment on the great job the director and her team um, um, uh, has put together. Um, it is really uh, great to hear that uh, we don't need to um, face any budget reduction. I'm really excited about the Ethics at Work uh, new initiative and I know that the primary target is to work with um, government and uh, employees, but uh, to create a clean government culture, um, it, it's two ways. The, the public also needs to be engaged. So I like to see as highlight the outreach effort um, under this new initiative that uh, we need to really bring together the, um, the communities. And I think I asked this question before because now we are looking at at least six new employees um, to join the team. Um, the city's population has changed, the demographics has changed, and we also need to reflect that uh, if we are uh, to serve our um, city ably. And I do know that the city also has a language access policy. So I would like to see, uh, especially the four specialists, outreach specialists, that um, of course we cannot require them to have additional language skills, but I think there are ways that you can um, encourage um, people who have additional language skills that is complementary to the city's prevailing population to encourage them to apply so that our commission staff um, can reflect the city population that we serve so I would renew that request to make sure that number one, you can legally do it. And number two, we really make an effort to uh, bring in folks who have the additional, um, um, not, not the additional, but the cultural and linguistic uh, set of skills that we could reach um, the currently um, under invisible population, so to speak. And the second thing is, in terms of um, 
reaching out to, you know, building an ethics at work um, culture, um, I would like to see, and, and, and maybe we can uh, start building it right now to really bring in a broader community engagement than we have right now. Um, I would love to see us uh, reaching out to um, the, the, in addition to the mainstream uh, groups and, and media, we need to target independent neighborhood media, ethnic media, uh, community serve or uh, community serving uh, organizations, civic as well as social service, to really let them know what this program is, what are the the um, commission's um, programs, so that to really bring them slowly in into our um, uh, partnership to really build a broader stakeholder community. So if we can emphasize that as among our top priorities for the next fiscal year, that would be really helpful. Uh, I think that it's not gonna, we cannot achieve it overnight, but I, at least if we can start now to build up a plan. Uh, and I think that the Board of Supervisors would love to see and they may even want to host us you know in one of their district meetings so i really hope that we can really emphasize that with the new staff we're really going to build up our community engagement public outreach thank you uh commissioner lee and i um concur with your remarks one thing i was thinking about you're talking about our um, public outreach position um i think it's going to be really important that that also have a um very strong listening you know um element to that um person's job description that um it's you know it's it's not going to be meaningful if we're just pushing out a bunch of information to an an audience of none um it's really important that um as commissioner Lee was saying that we try and actively engage with all the various disparate communities within San Francisco and figure out what they um, uh, are saying about, you know, um, ethics and um, what they want to see from the city. So um, when you're describing that position, hopefully that's part of it. And and also I wanted to say, I. There, there's 30,000 employees in the city and county of San Francisco. Um, the fact that we're going to have a few um, training specialists to help engage with that uh, workforce is great. But if we don't enlist the entire city um, leadership in this exercise, then what we're going to have is just, you know, is, is on the impact scale, it's going to be minuscule. We'll, you know, we'll reach as many people as those individuals can talk to. So I want to make sure that as, as you're presenting what ethics at work is, that you've had an opportunity to talk particularly with the city attorney and for that matter, the district attorney, given how, um, engaged uh, both of those offices are with the um, corruption investigation and have gained new insight into just how wrong um, the the you know work culture can go in terms of ethical compliance um, and also something that Commissioner Bush had sent me um, was highlighting in a jurisdiction I can't remember which one uh, trying to improve their ethics uh, culture, I think it might have been in Ohio, that they were looking at having each department um, identify what they called an ethics officer. And I know in our city, um, from having been counseled to various departments, that it, 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 there's no uniform role that someone has within a department to be the person that somebody goes to to say, I have this issue, you know, whether it's personal or something that they observe in a, in a coworker. Um, sometimes it's HR, sometimes it's a deputy director, et cetera. But I know as part of your Form 700 work that you're doing outreach to the various departments 
um, on that score. So integrating that um, engagement with the departments, because frankly, um, to, to me, having watched, you know, the, um, the culture of the city change over the, the years, it's, it's that um, each department has its own culture. And if we don't tap into that individual department's um, structure and, and key it to compliance, um, we won't, won't be effective. So having both your, your public outreach person be in a engagement and listening mode with the general public, but also with the 30,000 employees of the city and county of San Francisco, and then having those three people who are our ethics at work people, you know, working with them to draft a, a training module that that is going to be completely different for a public health worker who's constantly dealing with nonprofit contracts as opposed to, you know, somebody who works on a lot of capital projects and is dealing with major engineering companies. You know what I'm saying? I just, I, I think it's a huge task um, and you have the beginnings of the effort, but um, anyway, it's, it's going to be really important that we get everybody involved and that we're not just trying to like poke the giant, you know, from three little people. Um, Commissioner Lee. If I could, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to um, emphasize a couple of points. Number one, when I say public engagement and outreach, I don't mean us talking to other folks. I, I really appreciate what the uh, chair said. It is basically the listening mode because uh, without understanding where, where people are, we, we really should not be just telling people, these are our plans, what do you think? Uh, it, it needs to be the other way first. And secondly, I want to raise a very successful uh, federal um, uh, uh, program because the federal government is so huge. And anytime when you have something done, not one department can get the message across. So um, many um, initiatives that we have tried to push through, we always put together what we call interagency working group, which is every department, you have somebody assigned to work on ethics, whatever, so that when the ethics commission has something happening, you meet with the 20 people every month to share, hey, this is what ethics at work is. How can we work together? How can we uh, um, uh, work together on the whistleblower program? What work, what doesn't work for you? So I do think that given the fact that we only have, yes, we have new staff, but you're right you know, with the four additional staff, you know, it is impossible for them to reach even one or two agency effectively. So if we can put together, you know, bringing in all the resources, uh, like-minded um, folks, put together these working groups. Um, it's worked really well. It takes a while um, to put it together, but after six months or a year, uh, you have your own team. Um, that's part of the the extended, you know, ethics family, or so to speak. And I think that uh, that's one of the best practices coming out from the federal government. Uh, and I really think that that could really work in the city government. Um, and that would really address, you know, not having four people doing everything, but for people reaching out and building um, a broader uh, um, uh, team. Thank you. And now, Commissioner Bush, you've patiently waited with your hand up. I, I have, I've waited. I don't know patiently is the right word. But <laughs> thank you for giving me that flood uh, uh Director Pelham, can you remind us how many staff were there when you were came on board as the director? I believe there were 19 positions. And maybe now there'll be, 30, be 33. Mm -hmm. So it's nearly a doubling. So it was 36, it would be a doubling. Yes. Maybe 38. You're right. 
If it was 38, it would be lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Never mind. Sorry. I'm not in math. <laughs> um, that's very impressive. And it certainly speaks to uh, the importance of the Ethics Commission as well as the effectiveness of the management that you have brought. So I, I salute you and congratulate you on all of that. Um, the, uh, the issues that I wanted to bring up here uh, in terms of the budget and looking at it is I would like to see uh, us develop uh, a, pl a plan of outcomes, what we would see as the outcomes of these changes. That's one of the things that the budget analysts recommended that ethics do is develop specific outcomes that are expected. So if you are going to do ethics at work training, what are going to be the outcomes of that? Um, that's, that's one thing. Secondly, in developing uh, ethics at work program, I think it'd be good for uh, the commission itself to have an opportunity to see what is going to go into that training. Because it, I don't think it should be just how to fill out a Form 700. I think it has to be uh, the broader a range of uh, ethics requirements, and some of which are done by the Ethics Commission and some are done by uh, commission secretaries or department heads. Uh, but there are a variety of others, and I think that we need to see the universe of all of that in one place. And I think that the commission's uh, participation in that process uh, adds value. Uh, or at least that's what I'd like to think that we do. Um, I'd like to see a specific plan to address uh, a lobbyist audit. audit, audit audit. Sorry, I'm having trouble speaking today. Um, I saw that they that you had received a, a staff memo on how to proceed on a, a lobbyist audit. Uh, I don't know if that uh, has now been put into place pending staff to accomplish it uh, so that you have a, a roadmap ready to go or if you need to still review it and add a roadmap to it. But I think we definitely need to have uh, a specific plan and a, a timeline in this uh, budget that we we're looking at on an auto, on a lobbyist audit, uh, which is of course required by the charter itself that we do at least one a year. So it's, it's, uh, it's not simply uh, an empty wish list. I think that in terms of what, uh, Commissioner Lee is talking about uh, the diversity and equity. I, I have a question about whether or not the city still has a program to allow a bonus or an award for uh, excellent work. And if we couldn't interpret that to mean a bonus for employees at ethics or who work with us who have facility in a language other than just English. Do you know if that still exists as a program? Uh, Commissioner Bush, yes, there is, as I understand it, uh, some provisions in the city that uh, allow for a uh, premium to be paid to employees who the city has certified have certain language skills. So we can certainly provide more information to you all on that. I don't know the details, but I know I know that those still exist in, and I, uh, so we can provide more background if you're interested in that. I am. I, I'm hoping that the premium can go beyond uh, language facility, but include such things as facility with uh, the internet uh, and how to do uh, uh, internet searches and all the rest of that stuff that we have to know in order to assist the public. I mean, for example, in looking at Facebook, uh, I think that what I found was that the most recent Facebook posting from the Ethics Commission was in April of 2018, April 17th, 2018, which is a long time to go without speaking up. Uh, and if we did nothing more than just posted the agenda 
for each of our month's meetings and the minutes that followed. That would be more than we have now. Uh, and I know that there are equivalents to Facebooks that are not in English. Uh, and I would encourage that we have some staff facility as in capacity, uh, not, uh, a, not a location uh, where that can be done. Um, there's a, a whole list of things that I'm hoping that we're going to get brought up to date with this year. For example, um, uh, the lobbyist data sets, uh, which has not been changed since 2017. And I know that there are uh, uh, hiccups about how to create um, uh, automation on, on data. But we've been looking at that for four years. And it seems like after four years, we either have a, a system or we have to find another provider because that's a long time to go without being able to do that. Same thing, uh, I noticed that when we put up the uh, people who did not file Form 700s, it just says they didn't file by April 8th. But we don't go on to say that they have filed since that time. So I looked at a number of them and they filed on April 9th. And yet they're still showing on the ethics webpage as non-filers. And some of them are elected officials who probably uh, would like that not to say that they didn't file when they may have filed after April, but they did file. Um, in the ethics at work, uh, it seems to me that we might want to pick up on the budget analyst, uh, which is that we uh, provide a target of starting off with the, those offices that, uh, that have the greatest risk. For example, building inspectors, and that they become the first group that we try and put together so that there's a, a, a sequence that we look at instead of just saying, well, we're diving in and we've got 3,000 people to, to train, but let's start off and train all the building inspectors or all, all the people who inspect nursing homes or whatever it is where there's a, a risk of not complying with things as fully as we'd like them to do. So uh, those are some of the points. Uh, there's one additional one, and that is that uh, in our reporting and the agenda for today, we talk about audit reports that uh, have now been completed and submitted to the commission for approval. And it says that the audit reports will be posted on our webpage, but I couldn't find any place on our webpage where the audit reports are posted. There's nothing labeled audit reports, and maybe it's buried under some other category, like enforcement or something like that. No. But it's just, I couldn't find them. Okay. Uh, and so uh, we need to make sure that when we say something's going to be posted, that there is a place where it is in fact posted. Um, so uh, do you have questions for me? You're entitled. <laughs> I don't hear you. I'm sorry, you, Chair Ambrose, was the, uh, Commissioner Bush, were you directing that at me or that to, to the other commissioners? Uh, well, to you to begin with, and then any of the commissioners who have questions about my questions. Uh, yes, so uh, you have a, have a very um, thorough list of, of um, suggestions and things we need to keep in mind as we're continuing to move forward on putting our projects for FY22 together. I think those are all very, very helpful. Um, just a quick note I wanted to make about the audits, uh, and I'll speak to this in my executive director's report where it's noted, but we do have an audit page. Audits that have been completed have been posted and are posted publicly on our website. So they are not audits that come to the commission for approval. They are audits that are posted publicly when completed. So I'm happy to walk through 
uh, or follow up with you after the meeting to, to show you where that can be found. But they are. Well, maybe, you, maybe you could say now in front of the public so that everybody can know where they're posted because I didn't find them. And I'm, I'm not a, a slump at this. On our web page, um, one moment, please. From the commission's homepage at sfethics.org, right. there's a tab that shows compliance, an arrow that shows compliance. And when you list that, when you identify that drop down menu, it shows campaigns. And when you click on campaigns, it shows another menu that shows campaign audits. That campaign audits page in two clicks takes you to a page that explains the audit process, the audit selection process that we have used over the years. It explains required reports, or excuse me, required records that campaigns are required to keep for their audits. And it also links directly to a page called audit reports. On the audit reports page, that lists all audit reports from 2018 that we've issued back to 1997 and prior, 1997 and 98. So it is available through our compliance, our campaigns, and campaign audit page. That as a general, happen. as a general rule, anytime you have to click uh, three or more times, it's considered useless, and that sounds like we're clicking about five times to get to audit reports. Is that right? I counted three, but we're happy to take that feedback and see how we might prioritize things slightly differently as we continue to improve our web page. In, in, you know, in general, uh, uh, the focus of all of this has to be public access and transparency. It's not for us, it's for them. So for example, uh, our listing of enforcement actions, uh, it has the date and the entity but it says under the enforcement, it's just some government code. It's like, well, why don't you just put gobbledygook as far as the general public is concerned? They don't know what was it, the violation that took place. Was it a failure to report? Was it a failure to report fully? But what, did they lie about who they paid? What, what was the enforcement exactly? And uh, just putting a government code down does not tell the public what they need to know. So I would urge that whoever is going to be working on this stuff, take a close look at exactly how accessible the information is to a member of the public. And also, as a rule, whenever these things are posted, if it's possible to update them on the Facebook, uh, for those who are English speakers and on the uh, social media uh, for other languages, that that be done as well. Because that's where people go for information. Sadly, but it's true, they do. Thank you. Okay, then. And... I don't see any new hands. I don't think I'm assuming. Oh, Commissioner Chu, that's a new hand. All right, please. Thank you, Chair Ambrose. Um, I I wanted to just comment on this idea of an outcome, and I think that's a very important uh, <clears throat> device um, and, and useful device to think about the Ethics at Work uh, initiative. And uh, a couple of things I wanted to say about it is that the, the outcome that I think we need to be focused on is, you know, around a culture of compliance. And I think that it's really going to be very critical to communicate and, and uh, convey to the uh, city, city stakeholders that cult a culture of compliance is not something that comes from ethics. We can help each department, we can help leaders, we can help individual employees, but that, that each department leader owns the culture of their organization and that they're responsible for creating a culture of compliance within, within, within that organization. And that when I think about this, I think that, and that the goal isn't, isn't that we should train every single employee so that they know all the, all the, all the legal and regulatory requirements of their job, 
um, because that's, I think, trying to boil the ocean. But that I, the, uh, a successful outcome would be that as a result of the Ethics at Work initiative, all city employees know that in their capacity as a city employee, that they have enhanced or special obligations when it comes to compliance around gifts, around political activity, around, around travel. So they know that there are things that they need to abide by, but we aren't going to require that they know every single one of them, because I think that that would be exhaustive and, and ultimately uh, unsuccessful because we can't train, you know, 30,000 people to know all of the legal requirements. But I think what we can do is that we can, we can, we can train and communicate and that the leaders can reinforce and then hold them accountable for knowing that they have these, that these, uh, a higher level of obligation and that when, that, the, and that they can, that they need to know when and how to identify um, the need to go seek further advice from the city attorney, from the ethics commission, from their supervisor, from HR. Because, because and then in that way, that creates the, the culture of compliance. The culture is the, is the force that, that directs and um, influences what people will do. So if, if the boss is not there, is the employee going to do the right thing? And culture is what helps keep everyone within the guardrails. And so I think that the, the highest impact that ethics at work could have would be around building that level of awareness or, or heightened sensitivity to uh, these issues, but not to hold them accountable or, or, or require that they know what all those issues are, but just know that they need to find to ask the question and find out more from, from the experts who are tasked with knowing all the rules and regulations, like the ethics commission, like the city attorney, um, like the public integrity unit, you know, all, all of those different departments. Um, and that I think will be a, uh, you know, a partnership with the ethics commission and, and the leadership. Because so, I, I think that what would, what would, to me, not be as successful would be for us to develop a training program for, you know, 3000 people to take. And then at the end of it, you know, how much do they remember? Um, it, it's because, because like all the granular detail, like people can't remember all the granular detail, but they can know, hmm, travel, maybe I should ask someone about that. Oh, a gift? Oh, let me, let me double check before I accept that. That I think is the level of, of um, impact that would be most effective. And because then you have, well, um, wait, you, you got a gift from someone? Like, wow, that, that seems like a really expensive gift. Are you sure that's okay? That's how you create cult a culture of compliance. All right. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. So I'm gonna ask the moderator to call for public comment on this agenda item. And just so you know, um, once that happens, I'm gonna go ahead and take a 10 minute break before we move into the enforcement uh, report and then on to closed session. Um, so if you could, uh, Mr. Moderator, read the notes for public comment. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item nine. Staff presentation on Ethics Commission annual budget as proposed by the mayor's office for fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 and discussion and possible action by commission. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. All right, public comment on agenda item nine is closed. And before we move on to agenda item 10, I'm going to take a 10 minute break. Let's say, according to my computer, a 13 minute break. So everybody be back here at 1110. All righty, thank you.
SFGov TV, San Francisco Government Television.
Division staff report, and we're going to hear from Jeff Pierce. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Ambrose and Commissioners. Uh, I'm actually going to hand it over to Senior Investigator Jeff Zumwalt. He's going to speak to the Commission about the City's settlement with Walter Wong. Um, Jeff is the investigator who oversaw the Commission's investigation and, and analysis in that matter. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Jeff Zumwalt, Investigative Analyst. Um, and here today to, to speak on this, uh, this, our role with the city attorney's settlement um, with Mr. Walter Wong. Um, before I do start speaking, um, just as a reminder, I'm, I'm a bit limited in what I can talk about today uh, for two reasons. One being the charter's confidentiality requirement on our investigations prior to the issuance of a probable cause report. Um, one was not issued. Um, so in this matter, since a settlement was reached, um, we're bound by the charter's confidentiality. Um, also, since we were not a party to the settlement, um, any discussions we may have had with the city attorney's office, um, I'm also unable to speak about. Um, but happy to give a little bit of background um, as far as uh, what the permit expediter laws uh, require, um, maybe give an idea of what the violations were uh, as far as the settlement and then um, answer any questions uh, you may have. Um, so permit expediter, also known as permit consultant laws. Um, a permit consultant is any individual um, who is paid for contacting members of the Department of Building Inspection, uh, Planning, or Public Works for projects that require a permit um, for a construction project that requires a permit, um, sorry, construction project of a million dollars or more that requires some sort of a permit, um, and also uh, permits from the Entertainment Commission. Um, permit consultants are required to file reports with us monthly. Um, every month, they're required to disclose such information as who is paying them uh, for their permit consultant services, uh, the amount of uh, compensation that they've received, um, as well as contacts with those city departments, uh, the employees at that department that they're contacting, uh, the permit that they're discussing, and a description of the project. Um, they are also required to report campaign contributions of $100 or more to uh, city uh, committees, whether that's candidate control committees, uh, candidates for city elective office, uh, city ballot measure committees as well. Um, so all that's required to be on their monthly disclosure reports that they file with us. Um, for any information that a uh, permit consultant fails to disclose, there's penalties for that. Um, there's the ones uh, mandated by the charter, or I'm sorry, listed in the charter as far as $5,000 per penalty uh, per violation, as, as well as three times the amount of uh, any amount that's required to be reported, but is not. So uh, in cases of campaign contributions, if you fail, if a permit consultant were to fail uh, to report campaign contributions, three times the amount of that uh, failure to disclose could be assessed as the penalty, um, as well as the permit consultant laws allow for late fees. Um, and that is $50 a day uh, for any information that is not disclosed on the report. Um, so that's in addition to and above uh, the monetary penalties just for the omission of the evidence, uh, required information. There's also late fee penalties. Um, so in this specific instance uh, with Mr. Wong and the settlement with the city attorney's office, uh, he admitted to 12 violations of uh, the permit consultant laws. And those were uh, contacts with um, city employees uh, regarding projects and as well as uh, failure to disclose uh, campaign contributions um, and so for that, he was, he was assessed the maximum penalties. Um, so those were the maximum administrative penalties, um, as well as late fees for failure to file the required information in a timely manner. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that um, I'm able to within the bounds of what I'm allowed to discuss publicly. Um. I did want to ask if you could just give us an update. I know that the settlement was is recommended by the city attorney and um, that the executive director, I don't want to say consented or concurred, but it goes to the board of supervisors. So has the matter been heard or calendared at the board? Uh, yeah, it has been assigned to one of the committees off the top of my head. I'm not 
sure which one it was. Jeff Pierce, if you know which one that is, that it was assigned to. I know it was assigned to committee. But not heard yet. No, not yet. Yeah, it was the, the government audit and oversight committee. Um, okay, and that, but they'll, they'll approve that. I mean, they'll hear it in closed session and then approve it in open session. So, but the terms of the settlement are public. So the public's had a chance. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure. That Correct. Yeah. And, and again, I can only speak to what's listed in there as far as that settlement, but it does list in there the settlement. Um, the uh, the violate as far as the code sections there for uh, failure to disclose contacts and contributions. Right, but and remind me, there's also an element in there aside from the permit consultant and the fines for the bribery, which is also against the law. But that's not what um, they engage with the ethics commission about. Is that? Um, my reading of the settlement is just for the, the permit consultant violations um, as far as the contacts and the uh, contributions, um, the, the bribery statutes under the ethics ordinance, um, and there's, there's not an, an element to that in the settlement. So that's not the reason that the settlement, in addition to the monetary fines, also prevents this... Um, individual to to um, serve as a consultant or contractor to the city for the maximum allowable period, which I think is five years. I thought that that was what, um, and I'm, I'm probably trying to remember what I read in the Chronicle and what I read in the settlement agreement, what I read in the statement about the settlement agreement, but I thought that that was the, the basis for the city seeking that um, basically barring this individual from engaging in that um, consulting practice and that but it's not recited there or is that because it's they're being pursued that's part of the criminal indictment to which the individual pled guilty yeah so mr wong yes he does have the still pending matter in u.s district court um, as far as if, if that bribery was a, a part of the city attorney's uh, decision to, to bar him from serving as a permit expediter uh, for five years, which is listed as held, I'm, I'm not privy to that. I don't know if I would be able to speak to that. Um, just the, the part in here involving the, the consultant require, filing requirements. Mm -hmm. And the, um, I guess the last comment, and then I'll go to anyone else. Um, you know, one of one of the things that that um, concerned me about our our efforts at um, culture or the ethics at work, and what we're referring to is tone at the top, but it really is um, the, the the problem that we're trying to remedy is that there was corruption at the top, um, and the access that um, these uh, the the private sector contractors, consultants, et cetera, had to the leadership in in several different departments in the city, which um, much more quickly than our three ethics compliance trainers are gonna be able to convey, conveyed a message to everyone from that tier down that there was no point in bringing forward any concerns about ethical behavior because it was the problem started at the the top and how how we go about reforming that I think is a challenge for everyone in a leadership position in the city um, in, in the situation with with um, this particular settlement I mean I'm, I'm glad that the individual pled guilty to the criminal charges and presumably that um, is moving forward, you know, through the courts for sentencing, et cetera. Um, and I support um, this particular settlement agreement. I think um, it's sufficiently um, robust in terms of the fines and the penalty to dissuade any other permit consultant for thinking that um, these rules, you know, uh, enforcement doesn't have consequences so um, and with that if there's any other comments from commissioners I'm happy to take them 
And that would be Commissioner Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a question. Um, Jeff, is there any, do you know if there's any movement, whether it's from the city or the state to create uh, oversight monitoring agencies? Because this definitely is a growing industry and currently there's just no checks and balance. And, um, that's not even a licensing uh, requirement. And that's the first question. The second question is, uh, or suggestion is, right now, we really don't know who is a permit expediter or a permit consultant um, is self-reporting, right? So for the different departments, whether it's BBI or city planning or what have you, is there any communications? Because if, if they represent a client, we won't know, but the, the specific departments would know. So is there any communications between those departments to check with us to say, hey, um, is this person on file with ethic, uh, ethics um, because this person is uh, representing a client as a permit expediter. So this way, at least we will build more um, um, links to know who's out there because right now there really isn't a proper way of knowing who is out there claiming to be a permit uh, consultant. Sure, thank you, Commissioner Lee. Uh, to your first question, um, off the top of my head, I, I, I'm not familiar with some sort of uh, a reporting agency for permit consultants um, other than our reporting structure where uh, permit consultants within the city, if they meet the requirements as far as uh, representing a party on these projects that they have to file and register with us. Um, I'm happy to look further into that to see if there's um, some sort of regulatory body um, that they maybe get certified through and, and get back to you. But off the top of my head, other than our department, I'm not familiar. Um, as far as to the second, um, you know, we, we, we think uh, we're, we're trying to foster more outreach with these departments as far as these uh, permit expediter reporting requirements. Um, one of our staff members that oversees the permit expediter uh, program is, is doing a, a wonderful job at interacting with these uh, permit consultants and making sure that their filings are up to date. Um, that is something we are seeking to do more in the future is engaging with these departments um, because whereas we, we know that there's permit consultant laws and the permit consultants that register with us know it, um, you know, we, we don't know how often the city departments and the employees there that are actually being contacted by these individuals um, maybe know if there's some sort of requirements. So uh, we, we have seen in other jurisdictions that, uh, you know, when there's been education to city departments as far as what reporting requirements are, um, there's there's been a change as far as uh, things getting reported to the Ethics Commission and then we get people or they would get uh, individuals in line with reporting requirements. Um, so that is, that is something we're seeking to do, um, you know, as, as we're going to be hiring these uh, ethics at work um, employees to help with this education and outreach. That's something I hope that we can be a part of as well. So it is something we're seeking to do more um, as, as we've seen that this is an issue in the city uh, by why this settlement and the stipulation that was um, ratified earlier in the meeting. Um, you know, we know that these permit consultant uh, laws and reporting requirements are, you know, of interest. So it's, it's something that we're seeking to, to make sure that we can get compliance and, and educate the city departments as well. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Jeff and Commissioner Lee. Um, Commissioner Bush, you had your hand up. I did. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a few questions uh, uh, along the broader lines rather than out of this specific case. Does the permit consultant uh, uh, disclosure or prohibitions apply to making gifts to people who they are seeking uh, permits on behalf of clients? 
And does it prohibit making behested payments the way uh, we are now doing in the case of lobbyists? Sure. So um, my, my understanding is, is as to the gifts question, uh, no, I'm not familiar with a prohibition um, in the permit consultant law as to making of gifts. Um, off the top of my head, permit con or behested payments, um, I do not believe so, um, but uh, don't quote me on that. That one I'm not certain of, but in my review of the law, I, did, I didn't see that in there either. We have... Uh... Each department does its own conflict of interest uh, statements that are applicable to people in that department. And if you go through some of those, you will find like a uh, commission on the status of women that commissioners at that commission may seek uh, contributions to a nonprofit that is being funded by the commission on the status of women, which is not unlike the relationship between the Parks Alliance and Rec and Park Commission. So we have a dynamic that's going on in which there is a relationship between city departments and private entities, which was the subject of one of the controller's uh, reviews. Um, and I think that that is a open door for permit consultants uh, and so I would urge you to take a look at that. And if it's appropriate, bring to the commission a recommendation that those uh, doors be closed uh, so that we don't see that happen again. Um, have you uh, considered taking the results of these, uh, of these cases and sending them to all the permit consultants so they are fully aware that the commission is on the the job? Um, well, as I'm to speak to this settlement here, you know, this is something that's uh, public, um, as, as well as the stip that was uh, agreed to earlier um, in the meeting. So, uh, you know, we think that these things have been announced publicly. Um, and so I, as far as we, that's something we can take into consideration, but I'm, I, I would recommend it because even though it's public, people need to know that they're hearing it directly from the ethics commission that there was an ethics violation. I'm not clear as to why ethics was not a party to any of these issues and why uh, we didn't uh, act under our authority for the violations involving permit consultants. Uh, I know in other cases, uh, we would act jointly. So why were we not involved in this one? Sure. So uh, in, in this case, I think just the, the decision to get this whole matter settled um, as once was the, the most expeditious route. Um, and it, it freed us up to then continue working on our other cases um, and try to bring these other matters to resolution that are going to be handled solely within the Ethics Commission. Um, you know, the, the city attorney's office was pursuing, you know, other matters. So this just got um, wrapped up into that and was able to pursue it and have that resolved at, at once as opposed to us bringing a separate matter. If I were reinterpreting what you just said, it sounds like it's, you're stating that it was not done because of administrative convenience. I would not say administrative convenience. I'd say uh, it was just a, the decision that was made to do it, um, you know, had the city attorney's office maybe not had other matters that they were bringing as far as involving these contracts, it's something we likely could have brought on our own. Um, but it's, you could have brought it jointly with the city attorney. That that wasn't it, that wasn't anything I was privy to. I was just the investigator um, handling the investigation as far as uh, decisions on how the matter may have been brought or something like that. That would have been beyond me. I'm raising it in the context of what Commissioner Bell brought up earlier, which was how the Ethics Commission is branded uh, in the public mind. And one of the ways in which it's branded is when it acts and acts as a commission rather than just uh, watches from the sidelines, which is legally about what happened in these cases. So uh, I raise that as well as an issue. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. No, go ahead then and ask uh, Commissioner Chu. Do you had your hand up? If yes, you had sorry. comments, because we have. Go yes. ahead. Thank you, Chair Ambrose. Uh, I would like to um, follow on to uh, Commissioner Bush's remarks regarding the participate the non participation of the Ethics Commission in the investigation, um, and that not even being a party to the litigation. And I think that this the the permit consultant aspect. Of of um, Mr. Wong's case squarely falls within the ambit of um, of the Ethics Commission. And I think that it was, it's really troubling to me and disappointing that we chose not to act um, in, in that way because that was for fully within our remit to take enforcement action, whether it was individually um, or alongside the city attorney, you know, as a party to the litigation. And now they have, and it's, the outcome is great. They got the they extracted the maximum penalty, but nowhere in there is the ethics commission's imprimatur of authority and um, and enforcement um, uh, uh, authority. And and I think that that's a that that's a, that was a lost opportunity. Um, and then so my my second question, um, are more granular. One is um, is Walter Wong you know, prohibited from acting as a permit consultant going forward so that he cannot, you know, continue his activities. And then second is the the basis of this case, uh, his, the case against him was his failure to disclose, um, at, at least within the, the, the ambit of this Ethics Commission um, authority uh, violations. Um, if a filer fails to disclose something, um, how would the Ethics Commission uh, even know um, to take an enforcement action? So, you know, put another way, um, is in the absence of an investigation, in the absence of a whistleblower or somebody coming forward, like how would we have uncovered um, uh, th this, this uh, kind of wrongdoing? Because on its face, we have to take the, 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 disclosures and the reports that are submitted um, as accurate. So I think, you know, my, my broad question kind of writ large is, you know, how will we know when bad things are happening um, from, from a reporting standpoint? Sure, thank you, Commissioner Chu. Um, without giving away the playbook, um, we, we, we do have a few ways that we um, investigate these uh, types of cases and, and try to uncover that evidence. Um, you know, yeah, obviously if we did have a whistleblower, if someone came to us um, and, and reported um, contacts, you know, or, or something to that effect, yes, that would give us uh, quite a bit to go on. Um, in, in the absence of that, we've developed some ways uh, to, to investigate these um, and, and to find um, compliance and to see if there are violations. And that is something that we're working through now um, and, and seeking to pursue um, in the future. So um, yeah, in, in a, in a self-reporting uh, scheme, it can be difficult, um, but there, there are ways that uh, us as investigators, we can uncover that evidence um, and you know, either bring forward a case, bring someone into, into compliance. Thank you. I actually wanted to um, just to, to make a point. Um, one of the first things that you learn as a deputy city attorney is that there is only one city. There's only one party. Um, so the city and county of San Francisco is, is the party to the settlement agreement with the um, a violator. And the, um, my reading of it actually was that the um, executive director um, was engaged and was part of the initial press release and announcement about the resolution of this case, and that it's not administrative convenience that you didn't have two separate investigative teams, one from the city attorney's office and one from the ethics commission, us looking at a smaller part of the larger violation of city codes, but that, um, and I unfortunately learned this you know, um, repeatedly as general counsel to both the port and the PUC over the years, when there is an investigation that involves the FBI and the DA and then the city attorney, 
control of that investigation and the engagement with witnesses and how by asking questions of one witness, you're making information available to them that'll screw up the next person's strategy for ferreting you know, out the truth. So the idea that one investigative team takes a lead on a particular matter doesn't mean that I'm sure that the Ethics Commission wasn't uh, involved and knowledgeable about the fact that this um, uh, effort was was ongoing. In, but in going back to the larger issues of sort of the branding, I think from here, having a communication with the permit consulting community in some way, maybe not, you know, we're just going to, we're going to forward them a copy of the stipulation that was on consent in this item and say, watch out, but more, you know, uh, some g reference to um, in light of recent enforcement actions and permanent consultant where want to communicate with you that, you know, this is where you find the information and use that as an opportunity because needless to say, um, San Francisco is like a big high school. Everybody knows what's going on. I mean, you know, anybody who's selling themselves as a permit consultant, which is really just somebody who has inside knowledge of how to get, you know, your document from the, you know, the um, electrical division to the plumbing division inside a building or, you know, how to deal with a discretionary review in the planning department. Those people know about these enforcement actions. But if we want to remind them that, that um, we are the engagement officer and, and we'll be enforcing that, I mean, this could be an opportunity to just send out, a, um, you know, an informational item to them and, then re and reminding them how they can get more information from us about how to comply. Um, but I, I don't think that we were in any way sidelined in achieving um, this uh, settlement result. Um, I'm going to move to public comment because we do have a fairly substantial agenda item in closed session and we still have the executive director's report and I don't want to um, run out of steam or lose a quorum. So I'm sorry, Commissioner Bush. You're muted. Thank you. Uh, as I understand the law, uh, nonprofit agencies that seek permits are not required to register as permit consultants. And so I'm wondering if that allows an opportunity for developers to team up <clears throat> with a nonprofit and avoid disclosures or any other actions that are required of other uh, permit consultants that are not nonprofits. Is that something that you think happened? Uh, I mean, an, uh, that somebody's formed a nonprofit, but they're advising a developer how to get a permit approved? Is that? I think nonprofits like Mercy Housing or any of these others, that they seek permits uh, and they are not required to disclose what, what they're doing, and they're doing it in a partnership with a for-profit developer like Baron Salazar. But they're not a permit consultant. They are a housing, affordable housing development organization, right? So that- But they are receiving- But they're, receiving, within, but they're, they're receiving, receiving permits, but they're not consult. They're not, they're not being hired by a developer to get the developer's permit for their office building. They are being hired by a developer to help the developer by developing affordable housing and meeting their affordable housing requirement, so they're that I don't I don't see that as a somebody who's selling their access to city hall as opposed to being a partner in a project where both parties are trying to get permits from the city. They might hire people. They might hire um, a permit consultant, but why would they be a permit consultant? I don't think that. Uh, the disclosure requirements hinge on whether your full-time job is being a permit consultant. I think it's whether or not you are receiving pay to obtain permits for a project that's more than a million dollars. 
-hmm. And so uh, therefore, there is a, a, a value to a for-profit developer to teaming up with a nonprofit thing other than the uh, set-asides and so forth because they are going to save uh, a lot of trouble in obtaining permits if it's through a nonprofit uh, agency. Mm -hmm. But first of all, have okay. you go, have you even looked at that issue? Um, as this, as this, that's to the staff. Yes, that's to the staff. Uh, Commissioner Bush, uh, we have not devoted resources specifically to that issue, but it's something that we can we can explore whether um, there might be circumstances in in the city that would warrant devoting those resources. Thank you. Yeah, and to your earlier points, Commissioner Bush, I definitely think if if there are not limits on gifts that permit consultants can make to city employees, and if there are not limits on the ability of a department official to look for, um, to seek a behested payment from a permit consultant, we definitely need to open that door and see what's behind it, because that seems... Um, as Commissioner Bush has pointed out, they really are a lot like a lobbyist and maybe you should be subject to the same kinds of constraints as a lobbyist would be subject to. So when we review that, if we can look at those two points. Um, and with that, I am gonna ask the moderator to call public comment and um, then um, if there are other comments but other elements of the enforcement report, we can take them after we see if there's any public comment. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you've just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of Agenda Item 10, Discussion of Enforcement Division Staff Report. If you have not already done so, please press star 3 to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have callers in the queue. Thank you. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Commissioners, my name is Francisco da Costa, and some of y'all have heard me speak before on the rampant corruption that we have in this city. Foremost, we have to remind ourselves that this investigation would have, wouldn't have gone anywhere had it not been for the U.S. Attorney for Northern California, David Anderson. So the gentleman who purports to know something about this investigation but says that he is only allowed to say a little bit serves no purpose to bring him before the Ethics Commission. We, the people, want to know fully who are these crooks who are operating right now, worse than Walter Wong, who I knew when I used to attend the meetings at the Port Commission. It is a shame that the Ethics Commission was not bold enough initially to be more forceful, more adamant, have the tenacity and the fortitude to do the right thing, but now tag along with what the so-called investigator is telling us. I know a lot about this case, and I know a lot about the controller's office. And I know a lot about the city attorney's office. Today, at another meeting, special meeting, people will go behind closed doors and appoint a general manager and then come and tell us we appointed this general manager. Y'all don't know about that. That's against the Brown Act. The Ethics Commission doesn't know about it. But once that person becomes the general manager, they will say, oh, you know, Nobody told us about it. So how the hell do I know about it? A 
and that we got these investigators who work for the city attorney who are sitting on their ass and doing nothing, absolutely nothing. And our, and our city attorney has been kicking the can down the street. And we, the taxpayers, are wasting our money because we do not have representatives such as the Ethics Commission, the Sunshine Task Force, the controller, Ben Rosenzel, others, to do the right thing. Sir, your three minutes have expired. We speak, but nobody hears us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. DaCosta. Are there any further callers in the queue? Yes, please stand by. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Is this me? Hello? Hello? Hi. Yes. This is Don Staley. I, I, I'm very surprised by what I've just heard. Like that gentleman who I recognize his voice, I know who he is, and he does know a lot about what's going on. And you know what you just said about uh, uh, friendly expediters helping out uh, nonprofits, nonprofits helping out profits. This is exactly what's going on. ECF, as a matter of fact, is your nonprofit, pretty much runs all this show. Pretty much probably is in the, uh, the reason why we're having this corruption problem right now. As a matter of fact, they hire companies that work for them that are profit companies that probably are created by them. They probably are a part of their company as if they're a child to, them, to that company. Because as you know, there's a non-profit organization that goes out and buys a hotel, let's say the Henry Hotel. And then they hire a management company to run it. But it just happens that management company is part of BCS. And just like the things that I cannot believe I just heard. Whistleblowers, I'm your whistleblower. I told you guys back in two, I showed you evidence in 2015 of Walter Wong, Nuru, Q, and all those people that you have just arrested getting this hotel right here, the Henry Hotel, through illegal means, through ECS, and I gave you all the, the, the emails, all the phone numbers, all the telephone calls, everything you needed for a um, corruption conviction, but it was not once brought up ever. You brought up some crap about an airport, um, a concession stand at an airport, and we're talking about super corruption. And another thing, DBI and DBW right now, that corruption started at the head, and you guys don't realize it works its way down. Right now, they're still confused as hell because they're, they're really worried that since they were a part of this corruption, all the people involved, they're still trying to cover it up, just like you guys are right now. And I'm really, I'm really not happy about that part. I'm not happy at all that you guys seem to act like you're confused at all, and we should have done this, and we should have done that. No kidding. You should have done that about 20 years ago. So that's why I'm, I'm really shocked. I'm shocked what I just heard, because you haven't spoke about the victims. And the victims are all these homeless people, and all these poor people, and all these people that you put in these hotels and stuff. Those are your victims, because the people that got busted were involved in that. With their, I mean, their hands were in the deeper than anybody else in the boat. We're lucky right now that these programs haven't fallen apart. And that's why you guys aren't talking about all the corruption and all these people that you've already um, assessed. Your time has through. expired. Yes, I'm done. Chair Amber. Oh, I was on mute. Sorry, um, I don't know if the caller hung up. I, I didn't hear the name of the um, organization. I thought I heard DCS, but I wasn't sure if that was what. Um... ECS, Chair Ambrose, Episcopal Community Services. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, and thank you for your comments, caller. Um, are there any further um, public comment pending? There are no callers in the queue. All right, with that, I'm going to close public comment and I'm going to
move on um, to the next agenda item. But um, with the note that um, I think that this was an important discussion and I want to make sure that we follow up on, further on um, the permit consultant review because Commissioner Bush has brought to light some, I think, weaknesses in our oversight, as did um, Commissioner Lee. I like the idea of, you know, having more um, focus on oversight there. So uh, with that, I'm going to call agenda item number 11, which is the discussion of the executive director's report, an update of various programmatic and operational highlights of Ethics Commission staff activities since the commission's previous meeting. Uh, director Pelham. Thanks, Chair Ambrose. Um, the, this month's memo uh, highlights a variety of, uh, of updates since the last commission meeting when I had the chance to, to give you an update uh, through uh, May. Uh, earlier, as earlier mentioned in the meeting by uh, Chair Ambrose, the uh, communication that the Commission asked for last month at your meeting uh, to the various offices following the controller's fifth public integrity report uh, was sent over uh, to uh, to those uh, departments. Uh, and so uh, that that was attached as part of this report for your information. Uh, the budget news we talked about under item nine, so I won't spend time on that unless you have further questions. Uh, there is also an update uh, in terms of the uh, what we're calling the e-filing for all project, the uh, launch of it, the expansion of electronic filing for the city's um, designated filers in the city's code for uh, uh, public financial disclosure reports. That has um, we've officially launched our official communications part of that uh, process. Uh, we reached out uh, in this past month to department heads, filing officers, others who were involved in that process. Uh, to give them an update on the process and where we are to offer our um, our, our, our our participation and our presence at staff meetings uh, as might be useful to them, uh, but also uh, providing them with a very uh, specific fact sheet about some of the steps that will be involved in this process so that they can begin to plan uh, their activities for the coming year uh, to help uh, make sure that this is a project that is successful throughout the city. So um, we were excited to get that out and, and look forward to working with the departments to, to continue to roll that out. Um, Commissioner Bush mentioned earlier about the, our lobbying disclosure database. And I, I just wanted to take a quick note on that, that there have, there have been gaps uh, due to um, some staffing changes in the SF um, uh, data, and uh, San Francisco's open data portal for lobbying, um, our lobbying information. Uh, we've been working over the past uh, six months with uh, the staffing that we have to piece together or put the planks in the in the in the pathway to that full information that have not existed that have been out of date for a couple of years. And that is that is on track to be completed uh, uh, this month. So the information that will be available to the public and if it's not already available, I can ask Stephen Massey to jump in or correct me if it's already online. But we've we've taken steps to correct that information, fill in that gap. Uh, and build the tool that will enable the public to be able to go in and actually actively search and download lobbying data for their uh, their interest and their purposes. So we're glad that that uh, progress was able to be made over the last several months. Um, so uh, uh, look for that uh, by the end of uh, this month, and I will report back to you next month with uh, more specific information and, and illustrations about what that information is and where it can be found. Um, also as to the audit program, uh, Commissioner Bush uh, mentioned one other item, uh, the lobbying audit program, when we were discussing the budget earlier. Uh, the lobbying audit program is something that is now actively in development with our new uh, audit manager and audit and compliance review manager on board, Linda Fong, who joined us in the middle of April. And I have been working uh, with our uh, with our, our, our auditor, who is currently on staff uh, pending our return of our other auditor from disaster service worker uh, deployment this month, uh, but we have started putting together an outline, a work plan for the coming year. And that will be a priority as we've discussed with the BLA, the budget and legislative analyst office in previous meetings and with you in previous meetings. So um, that is a process that is underway and we're looking forward to keeping you posted about that work plan as it continues to be implemented. Uh, the one of the things that I wanted to highlight also is that um, in, in this last month, uh, the audit cycle from the 2018 elections is now completed. Uh, two of the audits that we had selected for are discretionary audits. Uh, I made the, the decision to administratively close those uh, because we had um, uh, opened them 
May 17th of 2019, and we had not been able to make progress on them as of May this year. So two years after having attempted to start those, it was my judgment that rather than continuing to start those audits at this point, our limited audit resources uh, will be better uh, focused going forward on the new lobbying audit program, launching the 2019 and 2020 audits that are mandatory. Uh, and so we, I communicated that uh, dis determination to both of the committees that uh, we had initially selected as part of the pool back in 2019. Um, and we did post that on our audit report page as well for transparency purposes for the public. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that and happy to answer any questions for you on that front. Um, separately, the hiring update, I'm happy to report that uh, we have now today posted the position for the auditor, that the audit position that became vacant in February. We now have that position. They're accepting applications. Uh, we invite people to come to our website um, and uh, sfethics.org, um, click on our jobs link and uh, go directly to the web page that will take you to an application process. Uh, we have posted the investigator position that was vacated in, in early uh, February. Uh, that uh, window for applications has now closed, so we're in the review process. And again, we'll, we'll keep you posted with any further developments on the hiring front that come forward over the next month. But progress is continuing to be made to get us back to that full staffing level that, that we had targeted for this year. And then finally, one, one note on the revenues report last month, um, the commission you had asked a clarification about one of the figures that we showed. And, uh, and uh, in May, uh, we had reported a... Um, under ethics and administrative fines levied by the commission, we had reported a, a $32,000 figure. Uh, and the question was what, what contributed to that dollar amount. In going back and looking at it, that was a clerical error on our part. So we've corrected that information in this month's revenue report. So um, I just wanted to highlight that for you as well, since it was a question at last month's meeting. Uh, other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, and um, we can uh, look forward to reporting to you next month on, on further progress in these and other areas that might be of interest to you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn to the commissioners to see if you have questions or comments for the executive director. And Commissioner Bush, uh, you're not, you're muted, Commissioner Bush. A blessing for all of you, I'm sure, that it's music. Um, do we have any action going on about the redistricting uh, appointees? Will they have to file Form 700s as far as uh, ethics is concerned? And uh, are we making known uh, that there's an overlap in how the districts are drawn up and our role as a commission overseeing things like elections that will take place in those districts and so on and so forth. Uh, Commissioner Bush, I don't have an answer to that question for you. I'm happy to report back in, in July with any information that we might have. And Andrew Shen, I see you just jumped on the call and he might be able to uh, provide some immediate information. Yeah, good, good afternoon. I think we're in the afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I think I can briefly try to answer your questions, Commissioner Bush. Um, so Thank you. The ordinance convening the redistricting task force is currently before the Board of Supervisors. The current version of that ordinance does require members of the task force to file forms of in hundreds. Um, the Ethics Commission does not have any direct authority over the redistricting task force. The members of the task force are appointed by the Elections Commission, the Mayor, and the Board of Supervisors. But the Ethics Commission does not have any direct role in that process. Thank you. So the Ethics Commission does not make an appointment to the commission? That's correct. Uh, I wish we would. That would be nice if we did. Um, uh, I look at, at what's going on with that uh, as a, uh, a stand-in for Commissioner Lee's point about outreach to minority communities and engaging them more fully. I sent to Commissioner Lee and to Director Pelham and to Chair Ambrose a copy of what uh, the black community is doing statewide in trying to generate uh, participation for the state redistricting efforts. 
and I thought it was a, a, a model for an approach that we might take, um, especially since we have an ongoing need to be involved in outreach to uh, under our equity program. Uh, do we have, uh, Director Pelham, any updates on the equity program? Not at this time. Okay. Um, can you bring us something on in January, in July? I think we were planning to uh, as an update with what we have. Uh, happy to bring that back next month. Um, and certainly as part of the um, annual report, that's one of the sections that we'll be working on. Um, all right, so are there comments from other commissioners? Because again, I am concerned about our extensive closed session discussion and um, losing time. I'm gonna ask the moderator to call for public comment, please. And then um, we'll actually first I'll hear from Commissioner Bell. Very quickly, I just, I think it's um, appropriate that um, Commissioner Chu and, and myself and the staff did do a follow-up on the suggestion about orientation form 700 and addressing the issues that Commissioner Chu talked about in terms of culture. So we discussed that at the last meeting and we did do a follow-up meeting. So I just wanted to um, let the commission know that. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure as we move forward, um, we can then put that on the agenda for substantive discussion. Um, I think that the dovetailing of assuming fingers crossed that the board approves the money that the mayor recommended for ethics at work, as you develop the job descriptions and we think about how to um, articulate the, the program, the ideas that you have in that realm will be really important to make it um, effective. So, but um, moderator, can you please see if we have any public who want to comment on the executive director's report? Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you've just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item 11, discussion of executive director's report, an update of various programmatic and operational highlights of Ethics Commission staff activities since the Commission's previous meeting. If you've not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a barrel go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have no callers in the queue. Um, thank you. Public comment is closed on agenda item 11, and I'm gonna call agenda item 12, which would be um, discussion. And you know what, actually, um, let me use my executive authority. I'm gonna jump ahead of agenda items 12 and um, 13, the further public comment and go to um, a closed session. Um, and then we'll come back um, after closed session and um, decide whether or not there are items for action on future meetings and for any um, further general public comment. So that would be items, um, 12 and 13, so I'm gonna call agenda item number 14, which is discussion and possible action regarding probable cause determinations for complaints alleging violations of the whistleblower protection ordinance, article four of the San Francisco Campaign and Government Conduct Code, possible closed session involving, I should say, uh, public comment on all matters pertaining to this agenda item. Um, and uh, then following any public comment about our going into closed session, 
uh, I will ask for a motion to assert the attorney-client privilege and meet in closed session under Charter Section C3, 699-13, Brown Act Section 5495.6.9, and Sunshine Ordinance Section 67.10D to discuss anticipated litigation as plaintiff. And then following that, uh, we will have a conference with legal counsel about anticipated litigation as plaintiff. Uh, the number of possible cases is two, and um, with that, I would like the moderator to please um, read the instructions for any public comment on um, the, uh, the matter that we intend to go into closed session to discuss. Um, you're muted, Mr. Moderator. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So this would be the, I, I'm sh jumping ahead on the script, but this would be the closed session for item 14. Yes. Uh, so, and you want to take public comment right now, is that correct? I just want to. Uh, yeah, we're required to take. Yeah public comment um, before we go into closed session. Okay, Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion of the motion of agenda item number uh, 14, 14. 14. Discussion and possible action regarding probable cause determinations for complaints alleging violations of the whistleblower protection ordinance. Please stand by. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are in, online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. We have a caller in the queue. Hello caller, your three minutes begins now. So commissioners, I'm going to be speaking about uh, the whistleblower protection ordinance. So we, who are the taxpayers, we are called upon to help the city and county of San Francisco, which at this time is wasting millions of dollars, I repeat, millions of dollars. The paradox is some of us have been doing the heavy lifting, giving the empirical data to the controller's office because the Ethics Commission does not have the resources. And the Ethics Commission now is, should be mandated to look into what the controller's office is doing with the whistleblowers program, especially those whistleblowers who have given the controller tons and tons of information, which the controller takes and gives to the city attorney. And then the city attorney decides to sit on it. So you see, we have a dysfunctional Sunshine Task Force. We come to the Ethics Commission, we get nothing done. In good faith, we go to the controller's office, he does nothing. On the contrary, he takes all the information that is Ben Rosenfeld and gives it to Dennis Herrera, who today will be given another position in closed session. And again and again we hear that the Ethics Commission doesn't have any resources. So commissioners, let me tell you this. This city is saturated with corruption. 
if you are one resources, you have every right to go to the Department of Justice. Every right to go to the Department of Justice. In fact, I'm going to approach them, and I'm going to tell them how dysfunctional is our Sunshine Task Force, our Ethics Commission, our Controller's Office, and our City Attorney. We cannot call ourselves a first-class city if all we do is make excuses, if all we do is get investigators who are bidding around the bush. Your three minutes has expired, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. DaCosta. Uh, and are there any further call callers in the queue? No, Madam Chair, there are no further callers in the queue. All right, with that, then I'm going to ask for a um, motion to assert the attorney client privilege and meet in closed session. Again, under Charter Section C3 699 13 and Brown Act Section 54956.9 and Sunshine Ordinance Section 6710D to discuss anticipated litigation as plaintiff. Two cases. Do I have a motion? So moved. Commissioner Chu and seconded by Commissioner Lee. Um, sorry, or either one or Commissioner Bush, do you want to call the roll on that motion? A motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Vice Chair Lee. Aye. Commissioner Bell. Aye. Chair Ambrose. Aye. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. All right, Mr. Moderator, if you would please take us into the closed session. I believe everyone received a separate invitation to a meeting, but um, please advise us, Mr. Moderator. Uh, yes, uh, basically it's a separate email that's coming from WebEx. It should say uh, closed session, so you will click on that. I also gave, provided an email to you all as a quick reference to click on that. It's the same concept that you're...
SFGovTV, San Francisco Government Television.
SFGov TV, San Francisco Government Television. SFGov TV, San Francisco Government Television.
SFGov TV, San Francisco Government Television.
SFGov TV, San Francisco Government Television.
closed session regarding the anticipated litigation um, on two cases. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. A second? Second. Commissioner Chu, can we have a vote on that motion? I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, a motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Vice Chair Lee. Aye. Commissioner Bell. Aye. Chair Ambrose. Aye. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. And then further announcement pursuant to the Sunshine Ordinance um, in the closed session, the commission took two actions. In one motion, they moved not to ratify the uh, finding of no probable cause subject to further investigation. And in a separate motion on another case, uh, made a decision to ratify the recommendation of no probable cause. Uh, and with that, I would like to move ahead and call. Um, Excuse me, Chair Ambrose, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I but I, I, I think on the on the first matter, I think you should note that there was a dissenting vote. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, I have to announce the vote. I, I apologize. Yes, um, and the vote on the motion not to ratify the recommendation of no probable cause. Uh, the vote was four um, in favor and one opposed. And do I need to identify the commissioner's um, names? I can't remember if the Sunshine uh, yes. Order says the individuals. So um, commissioners uh, Bush, Chu, um, Lee, and Ambrose voted in favor of the motion not to ratify the recommendation of no probable cause. And Commissioner Bell voted against that motion. All right. And in the second motion on the other case, all five commissioners voted in favor of the motion to ratify the recommendation of no probable cause. Does that cover it? Okay. Um, so I need to go back because I skipped over agenda items 12 and 13. I am going to not call agenda item 12, which would be where we would discuss future matters, but I'm going to invite any commissioners who have future matters that they want calendared to call me and I will work with the executive director to get those on calendar. Item um, number 13, which is um, required um, by our rules is a request for to hear additional opportunity for public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda pursuant to ethics commission bylaws article 7 section 2. Um, if you could Mr. Moderator um, find out if we have any callers in the queue. Madam Chair we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item number 13, additional opportunities for public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda pursuant to the Ethics Commission bylaws, article seven, section two. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have a caller in the queue. Thank you. Welcome caller. Your three minutes begins now. The commissioners, many of our San Franciscans are fed up with the corruption that is going on on every level. And we feel that the federal government has to step in, much like a consent decree that is done with the San Francisco Police Department or some other agency. Now, you all may not feel that that is necessary, but when you are 
constantly tell us you are underfunded, you have no resources, you cannot do your job. And consequently, what happens in San Francisco is that quality of life issues are compromised. We have crooks, people who wake up in the morning, and the first thing they have on their mind is how to rip off others. Contractors, politicians, even the clergy, even the clergy, they call them poverty pimps. So, commissioners, you need to reach out to the Department of Justice for help. This is an emergency. This first class city is now known as a very corrupt city. Even the United Nations on some other levels, when it comes to homelessness and all, have said that San Francisco should improve itself. Even the United Nations. And in general, San Francisco, when it comes to disparity, has been compared to Rwanda, a third world nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. DaCosta. Are there any further callers in the queue? Please stand by. Madam Chair, there are no, no more callers in the queue. All right, public comment then on agenda item 13 is closed. Um, and before I move for adjournment, I just wanted to say, um, Commissioner Bush, the further comment that you had on the executive director report, if you want to bring that to my attention and um, Director Pelham, I'll follow up with you on that. I don't want to, um, I mean, go back and reopen that agenda item and public comment on that uh, matter again. And, Thank you. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. Um, so I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And um, I think, I got, you know, I think it was uh, Deputy Attorney Shen was asking, do we actually need to vote on adjournment? Who would possibly vote not to adjourn? Or do we just <laughs> say the meeting is adjourned? Can I just do that? Yeah, you don't need to vote on adjournment. Okay. All right. Very well. Thank you very fun. much. You all have a wonderful weekend. I really appreciate all your time and uh, the meeting is adjourned at 2 p.m. Thank you.